Hi there. I want to spend a few minutes helping you understand a few of the theories and concepts that you'll be reading about in chapters 1 and 2. So the theories I'm going to talk about are exchange, symbolic interaction, feminist, postmodern, all found in chapter 1, and one that's kind of an up-and-coming perspective called the life course theory, and you'll find that at the end of chapter 2. So first the exchange theory, which is sort of like what it sounds like. It's the idea that many of us form relationships or look for family members with whom we can exchange costs and benefits. This theory basically assumes that we are rational beings and that we like to weigh the benefits and the costs and make some kind of sort of even exchange in our relationships. It also assumes that relationships say stay somewhat static. So uh, one of the main um, examples of the exchange theory is the old uh, breadwinner homemaker model that used to be more common in the United States. The idea being basically that the man was the breadwinner and the woman was the homemaker and that they exchanged those various services um, to each other and that that both benefited. Now um, what you can do if you want to look more into this study I'm about to talk about, there's a place you can click here and go to the actual study. What this, what this study shows is kind of the difference between what people say they want and what people actually do. And I thought I'd use this example since we're talking about breadwinner homemaker. And basically what this shows is that while many young adults favor dual income marriages and seem to be more predisposed towards a more even exchange of income and homemaking duties, that in reality, younger people are the ones who still choose the breadwinner, um, homemaker, wife marriages more so than people who are older. So in this class quite a bit, we'll talk about what people say they prefer and how that compares to what the actual data is. And that's important because those things sometimes are different. Doesn't mean someone's good or bad because they say they want one thing and they do another, but it does illustrate that there are differences between what we say we prefer and what we actually do. So I'm just going to click here and take you to the Pew Research site. You can see there's a little bit of an article and there are actually some more um, uh, graphs to, to illustrate more. I really like this site. This is one you could use quite a bit for your weekly wonders and in your um, projects, your, your midterm and your final projects. So I just wanted to show you this website too. It's called Pew Research. Okay, next theory, symbolic interaction theory. This theory, again, as it says, it's kind of based on symbols and, and, and says that um, we make interpretations based on the symbols that we see and that from there follows our behavior. And of course, our biggest symbol system is words. And so I've included this wordle for you. And part of the symbolic interaction theory says that basically our words and our language is not keeping pace with how quickly families are changing. And if you just think about uh, all the, you know, step relationships you might have, the half relationships, the X's and the XX's, um, we don't really have words to describe all those different relationships very clearly. In addition, it says that we make interpretations based on words or actions that then um, lead us to a certain behavior. So I just want to expand a little bit on the opening the door example Cherlin gives in the text. 
And of course, he gives the example that when men open the door for a woman, it kind of reinforces that gender belief or role of men being stronger uh, than women. But the other side of that is, is how does the woman interpret the door being open? Does she see that as a kindness? Um, or does she see that as somehow insulting? Maybe one day she might take it as a kindness. Maybe another day she might interpret it another way. And so part of the symbolic interaction theory, unlike the exchange theory where it assumes more um, things staying the same is the symbolic interaction theory says, you know, things change. The world is fragile. Things change based on time and the individual and the group. The feminist theory. This is probably the best well-known um, kind of out there in the, the common world as opposed to the academic world. I do want to make a couple of points about it. First of all, when we talk about feminism, we're talking about a gender-based theory, not a sex-based theory. And we'll get into gender and sex actually next week and the differences. But basically, the feminist theory has to do with male dominance, but specifically around the gender roles that are predominant in the society. And it doesn't just pay attention to men being dominant, but more how the entire culture reinforces that uh, dominance. This is also a theory where there's some activism associated with it, and that's why it's probably a little bit better known. And I, I liked this image because it shows a little bit about the feminist theory over time and across culture. Uh, we often think of the feminist movement as having happened in the 60s and 70s, but really it's been going on for hundreds of years. The postmodern perspective. And probably here's our picture of Modern Family, a television show many of you know that kind of exemplifies part of the postmodern perspective, which, which says we have a lot of choices. The postmodern perspective is all about having choices, not just about family, but about career and about gender roles. That in the past, family life and work life was more prescriptive. And now, while we have a lot more choices, sometimes that can be overwhelming too, the many different paths we can choose from. Postmodernism is also about individualism and our self-identity. I think of that old, old jingle, <clears throat> be all that you can be. And it kind of reinforces, um, Churlin talks about individualism earlier in the chapter, that sense of um, sort of meeting your full potential as an individual. Postmodernism also talks about reflexivity meaning um, that personally people are reflective, think about what they're doing, consider, may change their path. Reflexivity is also bi-directional, meaning that while society changes us or changes the individual, the individual also changes society. So it's an ongoing cycle. This is another theory that sees more of the change in the world as opposed to things staying static. Again, um, gender roles, we've got this he can do it, which I'm guessing many of you recognize as sort of a takeoff on the Rosie the Riveter poster. Um, family structure can change and is quite different. And then our work lives. I've got a picture here of Chris Sewells, who's known for his appearances on The Bachelorette and The Bachelor. He's kind of the reverse example of postmodernism in that he comes from a long line of farmers and he's stayed in the farming business. That's not as common as it used to be. It used to be much more common for uh, people to always stay in the career or the business that their parents had founded. And that's, that's less common now. Also in postmodernism, post we talk about the created kinship concept of uh, being able to 
form kinship ties with people that we choose as opposed to the more traditional biological and legal um, examples of, of kin. Okay, so here's one of the new theories. This one's called Early Adulthood and Life Course. And probably one of the really interesting concepts about from this theory is the emerging early adulthood time period. Uh, I think this is especially interesting to talk about in a college setting. And what it says is that basically we take longer to go from that graduation of high school period to the full adulthood. Whereas in the past that might have happened in a period of two, three, four, maybe five years. Now people are taking more like 10 years. And that means getting the degree, uh, getting started in a career, finding a life partner, buying a home, uh, maybe having children is what is talked about as sort of arriving at the early um, adulthood. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I show you a picture here of a book and a fellow named Richard Setterston. He's actually at OSU. He is one of the founders of this theory, very well known. And if you find this theory interesting, uh, you could take a class from him about the theory, which is what I did in my graduate program. The theory also concentrates on birth cohorts and specifically what are the effects on people during this certain time of their life, the adolescence and the early adulthood, and grouping people by birth cohorts. So we're not talking about individual events like uh, a parent dying or um, parents being divorced or uh, those kinds of things. We're talking about big sociological societal events that affect the entire birth cohort. And that's part of what this life co course perspective says is that those big, huge events really affect people. So I'm just going to give you an example from my early adulthood. Um, I was an adolescent and a young adult in the 70s. So one of the big historical events that affected me was the Vietnam War. And not just the Vietnam War, but that it was the first war to be televised and that we saw pictures and images and videos like this on television. And perhaps even more so that there was a lot of controversy and pro protests about the war and a lot of political discussion and debate. And so for someone like me who grew up in the 70s, I grew up in a world where I saw the adults um, who were very, the, the responsible adults really being questioned by younger adults. And that pr had an effect on, my, on me and on my birth cohort. And that's what the life course perspective would say, is that those effects are very important to human development. So basically, what I want to say about these theories is, or I want to ask you, do you think these theories work together? Can you believe in more than one of these theories? Or do you see them as conflicting with each other? And that's part of what you'll explore in your weekly wonder, too, when you, when you delve into one theory and see if, if maybe it does uh, work well with another theory or if another theory kind of points out some of the weakness in the theory that you're studying. I think theories are really interesting because they really give us the why. In HDFS 201, we're not just going to learn a bunch of facts about what people did. We're going to think about why did these things happen? How did the forces come together, excuse me, that caused changes in families? So the theories really help us understand that. Okay, three more concepts globalization, sociological imagination, and the sociological viewpoint. Globalization first. I think Sherlin explains this really well. I'm just drawing it to your attention because it's such an important concept and it's one we'll come back to over and over and over again in this course. How much the world has changed and how connected we are to people from other countries and how much that affects 
our family and work lives. Sociological imagination is not something Cherlin mentions. So C. Wright Mills, who's a sociologist, defined this as the vivid awareness of the relationship between experience and the wider society. And I want to pull this term in because I, I think this is important to your having a good experience in this class. Basically, as, as you are studying in this class, I want you to be able to look at experiences and try to see them from a variety of perspectives. Most of the things we'll talk about in this class have no simple one right or wrong explanation. They're usually very complicated. And really, part of what makes it intriguing is relating your own experience to wider society. I'll want you to think about your family life, the life you've had, and the life you want to have. And also to consider the observations you've made about other people and other family members and how that all fits with the greater society. So we'll be using this term a lot, and that's what I'm, I'm thinking about when I use it. And finally, the sociological viewpoint. Now here's a picture of our author of our book, Andrew Cherlin. I, again, I think he explains this very well in the book. And in fact, he explains it by using himself as an example. Sociologi sociologists basically understand that there's no way that we can be totally objective when studying the family. Each one of us is going to be subjective because part of being human is having our own unique experiences, um, influences, and those will affect how we look at families and at society. So what we need to do up front is acknowledge our own experience and our own bias. Still strive to be as objective as possible, absolutely, but recognize the reality. And I think Cherlin does a really nice job of, of sharing his um, personal viewpoint on a few things and, and letting you know that, that he's aware that, that he sees the world this way. This is also part of critical thinking. Part of critical thinking is knowing that you have a bias and how that might affect your study. In closing, uh, I'll say that the points I featured here are not the entire reading or the entire um, course content for this week, but these are things that I thought either needed a little more explanation or were extremely important and critical to your success in this course, or that just were, I think, are a little more complicated and, and from having teach taught this course for many years are things that students have struggled with in the past. So I hope this helps you um, getting ready for your quizzes, your discussions, and your weekly wonders.